you know, talking about personal becoming political and then coming back to personal, I often used to wonder when I came as principal to BIS whether the lunch functioned for the school or the school functioned for the lunch. It was a question I always asked myself because whenever there was a change in something, we were told, oh, it can't be done, the kitchen will be affected. And I said, am I running a school or am I running a kitchen? And so it's only fitting that we have as one of our alumni, Rahul Akerkar, who is a biologist, philosopher, chemical engineer, and biochemical engineer, but more famously known for his passion about food. Rahul has already talked to us, and um, his whole perception was dare to do something different, not go into the straight and narrow career, make exceptions, and so he's been experimenting with food, inventing new dishes, and when asked, what makes you passionate about your work? His response was, I'm not sure what drives me, but I live to hear, thanks Rahul, that was a great meal. And so now we look forward to a great talk about great food. Thank you. Uh, wow, it's great to be back. Um, I guess in a place where perhaps it started, which is back there, you know, so. Um, experimenting with food and inventing new dishes, um, I don't know that Either of, thing, either of these two statements really mean anything. Um, because, you know, food to me, I think, is something... Well, okay, today I think food has uh, become sort of over-sensationalized in a way. It's, it's become uh, theater. Um, and I'm talking about the commercial angle, if you will, of eating, which is going out to eat in, uh, in uh, restaurants and you know there is a need I think for restaurants today or at least people believe that there's a need in restaurants today um, to go beyond the food which is you know in um, it, it's uh, sort of incorporates elements of uh, a theater people talk about molecular gastronomy uh, which is which is like basically um, so, sort of changing the physical properties or the, the the physical characteristics of the food to play with your mind, um, uh, you know, things along these things along these lines. But for me, I think food is a very basic thing, and it fulfills a a, a, a very basic need. And um, Looking at it uh, historically, uh, food basically, well, is for sustenance. And I think m uh, more than that, if you really think about the act of eating, um, it's sort of, it's a way for our heritage to be passed on, okay? I mean, people eat meals around a table, you communicate, you share ideas at the point, you know, at that time. And and to me, I think food, therefore, is something very basic. I think every time you eat, when you eat something new or you try new dishes, what you eat and what you try, what you taste, food should always take you somewhere. You, you I think, to, uh, to be able to appreciate what it is that you eat and to really enjoy what it is that you're eating, food must evoke in you, uh, eat, well, either a memory of the past somewhere like I mean I love tomato ketchup sandwiches okay so I know it sounds horrible but it's the truth um, each time each time now when I eat the sweet corn soup I think the first sweet corn soup I ever had was here okay um, so so it always takes me back somewhere and I think food should do that or it should stimulate you to sort of go huh and maybe form the basis of a memory that maybe 10 years from this point you will come back to. But I think what is a bit tragic today is that um, a lot of people, there are a lot of chefs, a lot of restaurateurs who because, um, you know, people have become in a way so jaded um, and are so in need of um, sort of looking at something sensationalistic, maybe, maybe they're not willing to accept that a dish is just good unto itself, that food is good unto itself, but it has to be 
you know, there with maybe smoke coming off the plate and, uh, you know, uh, served on a plate that's at an angle with uh, something else and, you know, some uh, sort of laser show in the background or anything else. But, you know, to me, that stops being food, okay? Um, and so I think, it's, I think it's very important for people who uh, sort of want to make a life of this, um, which is not a bad thing, but, um, you know, that you sort of be clear that what you're doing is perhaps something very basic, like uh, music or, you know, other things too. So when you talk about experimenting with, with food, um, I guess it sort of means different things to different people. Um, a lot of people ask me, oh, you know, you do fusion food, you know, and they say, well, that's experimenting with food. Now, I ask you, what is fusion food, okay? And to me, there are, there are two things, well, there are two sort of opposite ends of the spectrum in a way. There's, there's the sort of fusion that happens on a plate, which is perhaps people who've taken influences of different cuisine uh, from different parts of the world and dumped them together on a plate. But you also have something which is, you know, you can call a fusion cuisine, okay, which is something that evolves over time and works. Like if you take Creole food or Cajun food, it, it's really a fusion cuisine because it's the French. I mean, it sort of started with the French. You have influences from Africa, from the Caribbean, uh, from all these places. And over time, based on the way the people lived, uh, the way the people ate, you know, what was available, their lifestyles, all these things, this cuisine evolved. Our Indian Chinese food is a great example of a fusion cuisine. It's bloody good, too. So, um, you know, there is a difference. And uh, there, there like, is a difference. And if you talk about inventing new dishes, I'm really not sure what that means at all, okay? Because I don't think there is any invention in food, okay? It would be like talking to an artist and say, have you invented a new painting? You don't invent a painting. You create something, all right? And, um, you know, it's, you, you learn perhaps cooking techniques that allow you to treat food or to treat ingredients but at the end of the day, how you express them is up to you and your taste buds, okay? And it's based on your skill. I, years ago, attended here the first, and thank God, the last All India Chefs Congress. And um, one of the topics at the time was, you know, the bastardization of Indian food. And where overseas and um, it was supposed to be a very short talk and I was the, at the time, this is years ago when I'd first come back and I think, 90, I just, uh, no, 91, something, I just set up under the over, and um, I was really just starting off. And I was the only independent chef restaurant in this place. And um, they had teams from, you know, the Oberoi group and ITC and Taj and all the big name chefs were there. And so they um, had this topic about the bastardization of Indian food overseas, and especially London, you know, and they were talking about that all the Indian restaurants there are all Bangladeshi, and they talked about Rogan Josh, and now Rogan hai, now Josh hai, and they, you know, went on about all this. And after what was supposed to be a half hour or a 45 minute session, I kind of raised, and uh, it sort of went on for a couple of, uh, well, actually half a day or more. And they talked about, by the end of it, this great need to create a uh, tome of standardized Indian recipes, okay? Like, uh, well, there was a, uh, I don't know if you know, but there was a Frenchman by the name of Larousse who um, created, a, well, who wrote a book called uh, Gastronomy. And, and what it was, okay, is, is he standardized technique, how to fry, how to braise, how to saute, how to debone a fish, how to debone a chicken, stuff like that. He didn't standardize anything to do with recipes, okay? And so these guys talked about this great need to um, uh, create this tome of standardized recipes. And I finally got fed up listening to all this dribble, and I got up and I said, look, I'm sorry, but I'm no one here. Um, but really, you know, what you're saying is crap, all right? Because the point is, is that you know, you take a simple thing like the chapati. It's flour, it's uh, water, salt, maybe a little oil or not. It's three ingredients, okay? Everybody makes them differently. So I ask you, 
which one is the right one. All right. All you guys make a uh, bindi fry or you know something like this, and everyone is different. So I ask you which is the right one, and of course no one had an answer. And the point that I was trying to make is that the I think the beauty of food and of cuisine and of most things is in its <laughs> is in its uh, diversity and not in its conformity. Okay, and so. So uh, that kind of put that whole uh, thing to rest, and that was the end of that. But um, what I'm sort of trying to say is, um, which is, which is also one of my other pet peeves, which is this whole thing about authenticity. All right, and people come to my restaurants and they call me out of the kitchen and they say, Rahul, you know, this is not authentic. And I say, well, what is? Okay, uh, what does that mean? And they say, well, I've had your home fries, for example, and uh, I've had home fries in Texas, and they're not the same thing. And I said, no kidding, you know. Um, home fries are, you know, home fries. They're my home, and this is my fries, and, uh, you know, it's um, done with our potatoes, our oil, our water, um, you know, everything is different, okay. It's just by definition, it is different, it is here, and uh, so it's going to be different, you know, and, and we have this great need to sort of um, find a measuring scale by, by, uh, by sort of which you judge whether something is good, rather than looking at its inherent goodness, okay, if you will. And, you know, so there's always this need to say, well, I had this dish or something similar to it in some other part of the world, and, you know, it's not the same thing. Yeah, well, it's not the same thing, you know, because it can't be. In fact, if you ask the same chef to come from wherever he is in the other part of the world and cook it here, it's going to be different, you know. Um, and, and the thing that I try and tell people is, uh, about these things is that you have to ask yourself just a couple of things when you eat, which is, are the ingredients fresh? Are they treated well? Is the dish cooked well? Does it taste well? You know, all of these things. Does it stimulate the mouth and your mind, perhaps, whatever? And if the answer is yes to all that, then say, I'm having a great meal, and don't be afraid to say it, you know? Even if everybody else is saying, I don't like it, you know? Why? Because the press has said it's not a good thing to eat or something. So be, you know, be clear about trusting your own taste buds, okay? About liking what you like, okay? There, there is no right or wrong in all this. In, uh, in terms of taste, you know, there's a, my company is called Degustibus, which comes from a Latin phrase that's Degustibus non e disputandum, which means you can't dispute taste. Uh, in other words, what you like, I don't like, what I like, you don't like, but there's no right or wrong, okay? It's just differences of opinion. Learn to sort of um, enjoy your own opinion and your own tastes. And so, so to come back to this thing about experimenting with food and, and inventing new dishes, um, I'm, you know, I was sort of asked to speak on that, but I'm not really quite sure what I should be saying about that. Um, so I'm just going to say, I don't know, time-wise, do I have a long way to go, a short way? F wrap it up in five, I'm told. All right. The appetizer is over. It's time to serve the main course now. So, okay. Um, so... Basically, what I'm trying to say is that you don't invent a dish. You don't invent food, okay? And like people that talk about, oh, we've just created something new on a plate and stuff, it really, it means nothing. What they've probably done is maybe use new techniques to um, play with your head and, you know, you like have a, you like have this blue thing that, uh, you know, looks like a box and you, and you eat it and it tastes like parag and... I don't know what, okay? I mean, they have these horrendous shock and awe constructs that people do, which they call molecular gastronomy, and I say, why, you know? I mean, I would rather have a plate of bhel puri or something, which really hits me somewhere deep, and it, and it tastes great. So um, don't get hung up about all this thing about experimentation with food, because there really, you know, there is no experimentation. You're just redoing, maybe combining things a little differently, okay? At the end of the day, it has to go in your mouth, it has to taste good, you know, um, and um, that's really the, the bottom line of it all, isn't it? You know, it's just got to satisfy some need for you and it's just got to taste good. So, so 
I'm not a big one on experimenting with food or inventing new dishes. Um, I like to, yes, I like to play with flavor, perhaps. Um, and I do do a few things where I use some of my grandmother's Maharashtrian food and, um, you know, sort of try and try and use the basis of those flavors uh, to meld with something else. But they don't always work, you know, and, and I think what has to, um, what you have to be mindful of is the way it really sits on the tongue, um, in your mouth, whether it's, um, uh, you know, where there's a harmony, if you will, between texture, maybe you have something that's soft against something that's crispy, uh, maybe you want something that's a little acidic against something that's a little uh, sweet, you know, so you have your sweet-sour combinations. So, you know, there are, there, are, uh, there are ways to think of how you're going to put things together. There are guidelines, but at the end of the day, your only judge of goodness is how it sits in the mouth, and there's really nothing more than that. So, I'm stopping. <laughs> Um, thank you. I think that was spoken like a perfect BIS student where you have your topic and you say that that's not what was my topic and that is not what I wanted to talk about and Oops. go ahead and talk about I think that was absolutely perfect. The other perfect thing you did was you have ratified everything that comes out of that kitchen because the sindhikari doesn't taste like sindhikari and the dhansak doesn't taste like dhansak <laughs> and the tacos certainly don't taste like tacos and everybody hates school lunch till they leave school. So you have ratified everything that is the BIS paradigm about school and I have to thank you for that. Uh, see, uh, any questions? Yeah. Oh God, it's um, my sister. Also a B ex BIS student uh, well, until I transferred out. But what I did want to say is the reason why I think partly my brother, no, maybe the reason why my brother did not, okay, I'm mixing this up. My mother who is sitting here, who was one of the founding members of BIS, was responsible for that kitchen in the back. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did have a question, sorry. And the question is how does a biochemical engineer become a chef? And should we be worried? Well, I'm going, to, I'm, uh, I'm going to put it this way. For 10 years, I learned how to grow bacteria, so I think I know a little bit about keeping it out, so, you know. Okay, you have another biochemist who became a teacher. So, there you go. the biochemistry, nobody stays in biochemistry. It's the most rigid science ever imaginable. Okay, thank you so thank much, you. Um, Rahul. <laughs>